So, uh, my presentation is called Continuous Compliance, which I'm not going to explain now. Hopefully, by the end, it will make, make sense. Um, I'm going to start with talk about something that's already happened uh, more in the package software world. Has anybody ever come across the term software asset management? Okay, a few people have. So, this is a world that I, I've come from, and I was involved in it before the year 2000. Um, if, if you go back to 1999, 1998, software was delivered on CDs, IT departments in big corporates would ship around these CDs. So it became a sprawling mess and hard to manage software. And uh, there was no defined way of saying, how do we manage this mess? And then big software vendors like Microsoft and Oracle and IBM realized there's an opportunity to go and audit customers and recover some revenue, or, or actually generate some revenue. So, um, I termed it the Wild Wild West. There were small uh, consultancies who would advise customers how to manage this sprawling mess. But it was all their personal opinion. So, if, if you were procuring a service, you couldn't benchmark that service against a, a, any sort of standard. Around 2003, um, a few industry veterans got together uh, and under the banner of ITIL produced a best practice guide for software asset management. So this is all about processes. The book's about this thick. It's how do you control deployments, how do you marry that to software licensing and things like that. And it was initially authored for UK public sector. It became broadly uh, adopted across the world as a good way to manage, manage software compliance and software asset management. And then in the UK, uh, an organisation formed similar to Open UK called Investors in Software. And what they wanted to do is to take it a bit further and find out a way to measure the effectiveness of a solution. And that resulted in 2006, a, an ISO standard for software asset management being published. And there's three or four versions of that standard now. And... Um, and there's various other organisations. It's a $1 billion industry uh, globally going into 2020. So that's just the principles of managing software. And whether it's proprietary software or open source software, software needs to be managed. But there's nothing specific for open, open source software. And in line with the presentation from BT about procurement this morning, the challenge isn't about the reputation of open source software and how good the software is. It's about how good your solution is if you're selling to an organisation. So how could you demonstrate, if you're in a, a competitive situation with procurement, how could you demonstrate your open source solution is well managed, you manage security vulnerabilities, you've got a strategy for that, you've got a licence strategy. So for instance, this morning, WordPress, very clear, we licence under GPL and they had a strategy for it whereas most organisations have got a mix of licences and don't have a clear strategy, as, as an example. So in a procurement situation or a competitive situation, it's very, very hard for you to be able to differentiate that. And I got into our, a, a blog I wrote on LinkedIn, a software licensing expert started commenting on it. And he said, uh, why should I worry about open source software? It's not a relevant point of use of resources or time. Uh, I'll focus on Oracle and SAP and IBM. So um, I have had some dialogue with maybe s starting this journey, but more focused on open source software. Uh, and I've contacted the British Standards Institute, for example. And I was researching w what sort of guidance is there from uh, the BSI. And they produced a code of practice for healthcare apps. Right? It's about, about 22, 23 page documents of quite small text. And literally, this, this is the only reference in that document to open source risk. And it says, uh, yeah, be mindful of third party or open source components have the potential to introduce risk. So, in a 22 page document about healthcare apps, that's the level of focus on good management of the, uh, of the software. So, I think it's screaming out for a, a standard. And software is becoming more and more complex and arguably more dangerous. So, there's more lines of code. In, in, in today's modern cars than there is in a, 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 a fighter jet. And y y you would think 
but that will be all managed by that car manufacturer. I have recent experience of a, a major car manufacturer where all the ECUs ran the car, all the bits of software, that mostly outsourced to individual suppliers, and they don't challenge those suppliers if they've got open source policies and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but they spend a fortune on defending against potential risks, so malware getting into, into those cars. So um, it's quite a useful website, Information is Beautiful, and it compares different sizes of code bases. You see cars are the most complex by far. Uh, every, there's a computer driving every part of your car now, even the windows and stuff like that. And, and cars are getting hacked. So, that, so, that, so that the reality of software is, you know, with Internet of Things, for instance, it's not just a case of, if you think about security vulnerabilities, you get a lot of press about, oh, you need to update your LinkedIn password, or your Dropbox password, and things like that. The reality of the, the way software is being used now, particularly around Internet of Things, uh, you, can, you can kill people. Um, and there's, there's, I could give loads of examples of uh, cars being hacked. And it's really bad for the, the brand reputation of that supplier. So security is also something that you need to think about with compliance. Now, it's not always vulnerabilities. Sometimes it's just a bad solution. <laughs> uh, anyway, so just some talk earlier about vulnerabilities, things like um, Heartbleed, uh, all, all well-known vulnerabilities. So big, they've got their own marketing department, they've got their own logos. Uh, what people don't, at a business level, don't think about is you think vulnerability, let's go and fix it. Um, and we're okay. If you look at OpenSSL, since Heartbleed, there's been 40 49 further vulnerabilities. But of course, they, they don't hit the press, they're fairly minor, minor vulnerabilities. So, so the point is, and it ties into the title, which is continuous, you, can't, you can never say you're compliant on security because literally somebody could post a vulnerability on the National Vulnerability Database while we're sitting here, and it could be in your code, and you're vulnerable. Does that make sense? So it has to be continuous. Most people's solutions tend to be reactive to the problem. And I'm not going to give advice on licensing. I'm, just, just, I'm, I'm going to give some scenarios of how does it play out with licensing and how could it be also potentially a security vulnerability. So as, as was covered previously, you've got GPL, which is very restrictive. Uh, and you've got permissive at the other end, like MIT, which is less restrictive, uh, hence the permissive. But how does this play out in reality? Has anybody heard of uh, a new operating system called Remix by a company called Jide? Okay, so um, they started their PR campaign around uh, well, uh, beginning of the year, January the 18th. The 18th is important because it's how quickly this, this story concludes. And... Um, so there's loads of bit of PR around it. And somebody contacted, a couple of developers contacted through their public forum, their support desk and said, can we have a copy of the source code? And they responded by saying, it's not open source, uh, you're not a partner, you can't have the source code. So some journalists picked this up and uh, an example on InfoWorld, did Remix violate the GPL? So clearly, their business strategy was not to share the source code. Okay, regardless of the technicalities of it, their business strategy was not to share the source code. Um, and so there's a lot, a lot of press around this. Two days later, they, they issued a statement saying, we're now compliant with the GPL, here's where you can download the source code. So my, my point is not about the ethics of sharing code, it's more about the, a business strategy. So imagine that organization has got VC funding, they've got investors involved, and they're looking at that thinking, we've already got a bad reputation that we've got to overcome, which could impact our future revenues and so on and so on. So I just want to use that as, as an example of how it could play out. Another example, anybody hear about the BMW story, which is fairly recent? So got, got a guy in Australia, a BMW i3, that was browsing through his media player, and he noticed the GPL license notices at the end of the end of uh, browsing through his settings. So he went into a BMW dealership, walked up to the desk and said, can I have a copy of the source code for my car, please? And uh, of course, he got blank, blank face and all that sort of stuff. But they escalated it. And 
They, BMW, sent him a DVD with the source code in, and he's uploaded that source code to GitHub and said, oh, BMW, great, they've complied with the GPL. Uh, but it adds various other software companies' components in there, which obviously he's researched and he's blogged about it. Now, both those, both those scenarios are clearly about intellectual property and things like that. Here's where it can be also a security issue. Say, for instance, whatever company you work for, and you're not sharing your source code for various reasons, or you're not well managing it from a security perspective, and a legal notice comes asking you to share your source code, and your business owners say, we've got to comply quickly because we're worried about reputation. So the re reason why Jide responded quickly is because they were concerned about the reputation. So you haven't got time to go through the code and clean the code. You could have comments in there, you could have embedded passwords, but also you could have known security vulnerabilities. So somebody could just scan that code and start exploiting your customers and you're looking at a supply chain of risk down the line. So both those scenarios, yes, they're IP issues, but also they can be a security issue. So now we're getting into, into where we're coming from, from continuous. I, I kind of tie it into uh, like a DevOps business process uh, where you've got continuous integration, continuous testing, and you've got this supply chain of software. And I've put Puppet up there. You all heard of Puppet. It's a DevOps tool. I went to a Puppet user group, similar meeting to this, and we were talking about uh, licensing, we talked about security, and not one of those consultants ever get challenged on security or licensing. They just get the code packaged and out, 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 out the door. So that got me thinking about DevOps. There, sh there should be some way of, of, of managing security and, and compliance from that perspective. Now, the, the reaction typically will be, because this is technical, is let's audit, audit the code and buy a tool that will audit the code. And, 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 yes, and yes, you should do that. And indeed, there's various reports about the cost of fixing issues the further down the delivery cycle you've gone. So obviously, if you deliver code to a customer and you've got to issue a patch and that sort of stuff, so you could build it into your cycle. But going back to, right back to the beginning about software asset management, one of the issues back then in the early 2000s is businesses would say that's an, an IT problem and IT will go and buy a tool for network, uh, discovering software across the network. And of course they didn't understand the results coming back, they didn't understand licensing, therefore they didn't feel they were getting value so they buy another tool, another tool. So the same principle with code, if you buy you know, tools like White Source, Palameda, Black Duck, they're great tools, but if you can't interpret the results, you actually know, know, know better off. In fact, you're just probably more nervous because you found loads of stuff you don't understand. But anyway, yes, you, sh you should audit your code. And experience from working with uh, clients we've worked with, if they do anything, they will do a, an audit of the code at the end and then send the code back to fix any issues. So the security vulnerabilities they pick up, they, they, they will do that. Um, but the, th the thing about that is it's disruptive you might have another department doing maintenance of the code. It's disruptive, uh, and it could delay a, de delay a release because it's un unforecast for issues you've got to fix. So the, the other thing is if you, if you audit code and you pick up loads of licenses, you pick up loads of security vulnerabilities, if you've got no policy of your own, so I reference WordPress where they've got a clear policy with licensing the GPL, that's their policy, and then obviously you can, that defines what code you use, and what licenses of code you use. So unless you've got a policy, it's point of scanning the code, because you can't say what's right and what's wrong. Uh, so what is your strategy? Who's responsible for overseeing the policy and defining the policy? Who do you escalate to if there's an issue? What's the scope that's covered? Uh, and, and how do you apply it? And how do you communicate it through a training program? So uh, companies we work with, we create a training program. So you create a policy and then you have to educate developers and anybody else in the business that might impact about why the policy is there. So generally, if people understand why we license this way or we don't use those components, then you've got a policy. And then 
so the compliance that I was talking about is not specific about compliance to the GPL, for instance, it's compliance to that policy that you've defined yourself. Um, so this is a, a very simple example of something we, we did for a company that wanted to share libraries of code to a community because they, they've got a community. So we worked with them about the policy, what are they happy with, what do they want to share, what do they don't want to share, and it was different for different business lines that they've got. Um, but what, what we, we do is we, we monitor the code all the time. So if, if for instance, a, a vulnerability is posted on the National Vulnerability Database, now it'll, it'll pick up in the code. Now, most companies would have developments manage that situation, but what we do, we collate that information, and this organisation has a governance committee, it's basically a board of directors, um, and we do a summary report to the governance committee that says in the, in the past two weeks or in the past month, there's been 10 new vulnerabilities, severity rating X, Y, and Z, and development were made aware on these dates, and they have an internal SLA. If it's a vulnerability over, say, eight, then it will get fixed within 24 hours. If it's lower vulnerability, it's a longer lead time. But we can, we can independently monitor how long it takes them. So the next time they meet, a month later, we say, in the past month, there's been two new vulnerabilities, and in the previous vulnerabilities, there's still two outstanding that's gone beyond the SLA, and they can take that up with the head of development. So it's, so it's given visibility to business management about business risk and development, so just, just fixing it and, and, and going on with it, that they release. Now, where, where it comes into the scenario of, say, procurements and the reputation, not of open source software, but reputation of your solution, is when they do a final release, uh, version two of the solution, we do a report, which is a bill of materials, you've probably heard that, that said before, bill of materials, but with some interpretation that they can use externally. So they can go to their customers and say, or anybody who's going to use their libraries and say, this is the makeup of our code, and it just summarizes their license strategy, so it's got the GPL components in, or whatever it might be, and if there's a vulnerability over severity age, you'll get a fix within 24 hours, for instance. So then what you're demonstrating is, A, you've got good business practices, but you've got credible code, not just, yes, open source is great, but uh, and we, we can deliver the solution. Does that, does that kind of make, make sense? So, so it's addressing both the technical and the business side of things. So then going back to the uh, continuous compliance, then all the way through the development cycle through to DevOps, you're monitoring the code for all those issues. So you, really, if you start at the beginning by monitoring code and you've got a policy that says you can't use certain licensed components, for example, uh, or if you want to use a component that hasn't been used before, go through an authorization process, then you are proactively avoiding issues. So when you do a final build bill of materials, there should be really no issues there at all. So you shouldn't be sending stuff back at that point in time. So that is the, the, the principles of what, what, what we do. Now, w where, we f where we find this uh, becoming an issue or uh, getting traction from our business perspective, we talked about procurement. We, we do see that with procurement. Investors in tech organisations are now becoming more mindful of uh, definitely intellectual property issues, but also how, do, how, do, how do organisations manage security. Because imagine you invest uh, in, a, in a company and they've got security vulnerabilities which are known in their code and haven't managed it, uh, which could result in legal activity, and that's a bad investment. Uh, so we're seeing that, and, and the value of IP, but it's been a mistake there. Um, but where we're seeing a lot of activity is both from the customer perspective and from the industry perspective is in cyber insurance. So we, we've been approached by a couple of organisations, Euro European-based software developers, who are looking to make a move into the US market. And they're nervous about litigation in, in the US on various fronts. So they're taking out cyber insurance against future lit litigation, so intellectual property violations uh, and security vulnerabilities in particular. So then the insurance companies are saying, well, we need to understand better what's in your code, blah, 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 and we've been approached by both sides. So uh, there's various uh, insurance bodies 
that we're in dialogue with about how can they help measure the effectiveness of companies to manage risk in, co in code. Uh, so you might not see it now, but you might see it in the future. If your companies you work with take out insurance or plan to take out insurance, you're probably going to find more challenges about how you manage code. But today, most insurance companies look at how do you defend against uh, security vulnerabilities and things like that. This is about how do you avoid engineering in risk in the first place. Um, uh, and that's it.